There was another, well, we're in implementation details, another one that I wanted to talk to you about, and that's about drawing the hypergraph. So when you're applying rules to a hypergraph, you don't automatically get a particular layout of nodes on the screen. In fact, the layout actually doesn't matter. It's just the relationships between the nodes via the edges that is the universe. But it's nice to be able to draw these things on the screen so that you can show them in videos, for example, and show the universe evolving. So I guess the question is, how do you decide how to lay out the nodes and edges? Because the way you do so has an enormous impact on how the hypergraph looks when you draw it on the, the screen. If you lay them out one way, then the hypergraph has a particular appearance. And if you lay them out another way, the hypergraph looks completely different. So how do you decide? A very good question. And, and, and it's, I, mean, I know you've said this twice now, but it is, it is really worth stressing that it's, it's a very, very common confusion with this formalism, right? Where uh, people see these hypergraphs kind of laid out in, in, in space and they think, oh, the, the layout must have some significance, right? Yeah. And you're exactly right. It do, you know, it do, it's a useful way of visualizing stuff, absolutely. But the, but the point is, if the model we're using is, is accurate, then it's that the geometry emerges from the combinatorics of the hypergraph, not the other way around, yep. right? The, the, so yep. so um, yeah, that's absolutely worth stressing. Okay, in terms of how the thing is, is laid out, that uh, really has nothing to do with me. This is, so there's a guy called Charles Poo, who's the head of the graph functionality in, in, in uh, Wolfram Research, and he developed the sort of the graph layout algorithms for Mathematica. And he's really the, the, the guy behind how, how this works. So the default layout that we use in all the kind of Wolfram Physics project visualizations and things uses what's called spring electrical embedding. This is a, a layout algorithm which you may be familiar with, but the, it's the idea is you kind of... Okay, when you've got a graph and you want to find some, some nice visual presentation of it, what you're really doing is you're solving some kind of optimization problem. Yes. And spring electrical embedding is a very kind of physics-y way of solving that optimization problem. You say, well, let's yeah. imagine, and I should be clear, this is not physics in the Wolfram physics sense, this is physics yes, in, just like in, in the kind of classical physics sense. So you, you imagine, you say, well, let's imagine that every vertex, every node has like an electric charge associated to it. So, they, so they, effectively, every vertex is kind of repelling every other vertex. They, they, yeah. they act like they, they've got like charges. They obey effectively a Coulomb law with a, with a one over R squared relation. Then we imagine that on each edge, each edge is acting like a spring. So each edge is acting like a kind of perfectly elastic spring. So it's obeying Hooke's law. So the restitutive force is, is sort of is directly proportional to, the, to, 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 to its elongation. So now you've got these nodes, they're repelling each other. You've got these edges that are trying to kind of spring them and pull them back together again. And then you just say, well, let's, let's start with some arbitrary layout. And then yep. let's, let's simulate that system and let's see what, see what it produces. And for various reasons, uh, it happens to be the case that spring electrical embedding produces very, very nice visualizations, particularly of complicated graphs. I can't completely explain why. It, it's, some you know, it's, it's some weird combination of factors to do with our visual system and this kind of weird physics simulation that you're doing internally. But that happens yeah. to be the, you know, the, 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 the layout that we tend to use in all of our visualizations because it just happens to look nicest. There are lots of others that you could use. You, there's, there's, just, there's pure spring embeddings where you kind of you ignore the electrical forces. Yeah. They also sometimes produce nice visualizations, although somewhat less often. There are cyclic embeddings. Very often what we use for causal graphs is layered embeddings or layered digraph embeddings where you, you actually try and show you know, kind of the beginning of time, if you like, the Big Bang at the top of the screen, and then you kind of have every, you know, every event subsequently kind of, kind of uh, trickle down the screen. That's, that's, that's quite a nice way of representing these directed causal graphs. But certainly for hypergraphs, spring electrical embedding is, sort of, is, is the default one that we use. The point you make about videos, by the way, is, is an interesting one, because that's a project that we've been trying to, that we've been trying to get done for, for a while now. We had a guy at the summer school, two, actually two years in a row, Dugan Hammock, who kind of worked on various iterations of this. And there's a, there's a, a new person working on this now whose name escapes me, I, I'm afraid, but might come back to me at some point during this conversation. Yes. But this, this problem of how do you solve essentially the kind of time extended version of that same problem, right? So, you know, normally yes. graph layout, we think, or graph embedding, we think of as being a problem where you just have a graph and you want to embed it on the screen. Yeah. And that's because normally in, you know, normally when people talk about network data or something, they don't imagine the graph like evolving. But of course, yeah. in Wolfram Physics, the, you know, the evolution of the, of the hypergraph is what it's all about. And so yes. what you'd like to be able to do is be able to make some kind of visio some video, some animation yeah. of this evolving hypergraph in a way that keeps it kind of maximally stable, right? Because yeah. if you've got your hypergraph being rewritten at every step, and at every step, all the vertices and edges are in completely different places, it's impossible yeah. to sort of see what's going on. It's a very, very, it's very useless as a way of visualizing Indeed. things. Indeed. What you want yeah. is the equivalent vertices or the equivalent nodes and edges to be as close to their predecessors on the next frame as they, as, as they possibly can be. And that's a kind of a, a different sort of 
for one thing, it's a much higher dimensional optimization problem. It's intrinsically yeah. much harder to solve. And so one project that we're very interested in kind of seeing someone do, and again, as I say, we, the, the various proposals have been made, but I don't think anyone is obviously superior yet, yeah. is, to, is to find some algorithm that's the analog of spring electrical embedding, but kind of the time extended version that lets us make these maximally stable visualizations of, of hypography writing. Yeah, in, in some ways, it's you, you say it's a more difficult problem, and mathematically it is, but in some ways, you've got a bit of a head start because each frame of the animation gives you the initial conditions for the following frame. If you start with that initial condition, then just by the way that it works, it tends not to move too much if you use one frame as the initial conditions for the following frame. At least that's, that's what I found. And I, I'm not using precisely a spring electrical embedding as you describe it, but I'm using something fairly similar that... I think it looks good because the the edges end up being all approximately the same length. You obviously get some longer edges because that's just the nature of the hypergraph. But generally, if you're using these kind of algorithms, the, the edges end up approximately the same length. And so it gives you a much nicer idea of space. You know, if you think of, again, locality nodes that are connected by an edge as being close to each other in space, then if all of the edges are the same length when you render them, then it looks a bit more like that space with all its properties of locality. That's really cool. We should, we should, I'm actually kind of curious now to see what it is that you've done. We should talk about that maybe offline at some point. Yeah, that's great. That yeah, be, I'd, love cool. to, I'd have to remind myself what I actually did, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's not quite spring electrical embedding, but it has some of the same kind of elements. And I'm, I'm specifically optimizing for getting the edges to be the same length as far as possible, given the, uh, the layout of the hypergraph. That's really interesting. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.